Good afternoon and welcome to another Institute of Health Studies Satellite Seminar. We're broadcasting from the University of Plymouth and in the studio today we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Peter Drury. Peter will be a very well-known figure to many of you and he was influential in the development of the information strategy for the Department of Health. He's worked with Frank Burns to produce Information for Health and since 1999 he has been the Head of Information Policy Unit for the Department of Health. This unit gives guidance to the NHS on IMT policy and implementation. Peter was responsible for updating the policy document, implementing the NHS plan, building the information core, and he's also helped guide the development of delivering 21st century IT program in 2002. In the studio to discuss Peter's presentation, we have three of the key people involved in health informatics in the Southwest. Daniel McCarthy is manager of the Southwest Health Informatics Learning Network. Jason Bradley works for the NHS Information Authority, and Dr. Nick Gaunt is Project Director for the South and West Devon Electronic Health Records Project, Lead for Health Informatics, and in his spare time he's a consultant microbiologist. As well as being key figures in their day jobs in health informatics, all three are coming together to form a British Computer Society Southwest Health Informatics Group with Daniel as a chair. Lastly, you've got me, I'm Ray Jones, and I'm Professor of Health Informatics and Director of Research at the Institute of Health Studies. What we will do in this next hour is first Peter will give a presentation for about 20 to 25 minutes and at the end of his presentation he will join us again here for discussion. That will be your chance to contact the studio with your comments and questions. There are two ways in which you can contact the studio and details of these will appear on your screen in a minute. And I will tell you again after Peter's presentation but if you've got a pen and paper handy you should note them now. You can phone in using your mobile or any other phone available on 01752 233-646 or you can email tvstudio at plymouth.ac.uk As well as viewers down here in the southwest of England we hope to have viewers from around Britain and it would be good for us to have some idea of how many centres and people are tuned in today. So maybe one person at your centre could contact the studio using one of these methods during Peter's presentation in the next half hour to say where you are and how many are viewing at your centre. So now we go over to Peter Drury. Good afternoon everybody, it's a pleasure to uh, be able to take part in this uh, seminar today. What I'd like to do is to talk through some of the background uh, to where we are in taking forward the existing information strategy. Um, I'm head of the information policy unit and as such I feel very often as though it's a case of, of juggling a lot of plates. But the reason that I, I rather like this slide is partly because it also shows the fact that the plate juggler has been travelling uh, and I think it also gives an indication that uh, he's on the move and on the move forward. But the other reason that I, I also like it is that it, in, in the poles that are on, the, uh, on, 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 on top of which the plates are, it's also clear that there are perhaps sort of particular places where the plate juggler needs to give the, uh, give the plate and, and the pole a, a particular push. And I think there's also the implication that actually it isn't just that particular plate juggler. This is a landscape full of plates on poles. And if we think actually about what the plates might be and think that actually in the context of the NHS, the plates are patients then actually we are all juggling a lot of plates. It's certainly not just me and the information policy in it. And part of the importance, I think, of understanding where information fits in is the realisation that actually the management of information requires a lot of different people to be involved, each of them playing their part in spinning the pole so that the plate or the, or the patient is properly looked after. And when that goes well, then that's wonderful. But when it doesn't go well, then we can have the tragedies such as, as the fate of Victoria Climbier. Um, and there'll be a report, the formal report, on her tragic uh, death uh, being published very shortly. But in essence, uh, it was quite clear that in deciding who was to blame for her death, social workers, police, doctors, all named and shamed. So the basic point is that healthcare is something where information needs to be exchanged, not just within the NHS, but if we're taking 
an approach where the plate or the patient is the centre of our attention, then there are a lot of people that all have to play their part in keeping uh, the show on the road. So with that sort of just general introduction, let me press on by taking as my starting point getting better with information, which is a strategy we published in 1992. And I don't make apologies for going back to 1992 to start this presentation because I think when we published that strategy, we made the uh, basic uh, strategic uh, direction in terms of having person-based systems resting on top of a national infrastructure. And frankly, that has remained our strategic direction of travel ever since. Now, the difficulties with information for health were that it came with no money, there was very little political support, uh, there was certainly not much informed clinical support, uh, and it was perceived during the course of the 1990s, the early 1990s at any rate, as being very much concerned really with providing information for managers. And it was clear, or became clear during the 1990s, that when the time came to have a refresh of the strategy, that that needed to be undertaken preferably by somebody who, who came from the service, as Frank Burns did. And Frank's uh, lead in developing the Information for Health strategy in 1998 had, as its sort of defining criteria, the desire to develop information that was really there to support the core business of the NHS, that's to say the delivery of care to patients. Um, and what I want to talk about really is what has happened since 1998 and the publication of, of Information for Health. And there have been a number of very important shifts in the balance of power since then which we need to be aware of. For example, the NHS plan began to talk explicitly about services designed around the patient. So although in 92 we talked about person-based systems, actually it wasn't really until the whole uh, NHS plan began to talk about shifting the thinking so that the patient is in focus rather than the profession or the organisation that we really uh, had much of a chance, I think, of, of beginning to implement the strategy effectively. Uh, another very important uh, part of, of the context has been the development of the e-government strategy which is trying to ensure that across government the citizen in that context is at the focus of uh, the development of, 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 of information and management policy. How is it that citizens can easily get access to the information they need? And in the NHS context, that is increasingly being translated into the choice agenda so that, for example, we can now have uh, patients able to choose not only when but where they can have their uh, care being delivered. And these changes have only just begun really to be articulated uh, in the last two years or so. Uh, since 98, we've had much greater attention being paid to the development of clinical standards, of clinical governance and the development of care pathways, all things that are very necessary uh, to have uh, person-based uh, care and have important corollaries for the information services that are needed to underpin them. Organisationally, of course, we've had the shifting the balance of power, uh, strategy which we are of course in, in the process of, of, of working through at the moment and that is pr providing a very important and radical shift I think in the way in which the NHS is being managed and the monies to support those changes and in particular the monies to uh, support the changes in information and IT that are needed to modernise the service in, in this sort of way were reinforced by the findings that Derek Wanless came up with in his report of just, just about a year or so ago uh, that really gave a comparative basis for uh, making investment in, in information and IT and quite clearly that needs to be a priority. So as we have been working towards delivering 21st century IT, which I'll talk about more in a moment, um, it's important to understand, I think, that whilst we've been shifting the balance of power out to the NHS and decentralising, uh, 
the, the, the changes that have been going on in the information and IT environment have been influenced by the fact that in practice, since the Information for Health strategy was launched in 98 and the billion pounds worth of money that came with it was put out to the service, actually what was happening was that local IT monies were being used on other priorities and the service was saying, we don't like having to do this, but because of local priorities and national priorities indeed, we have to do it. If we're ever going to make a success of implementing information in IT, we have to get more central control over the money and there has to be more central direction. Now, that's an important shift because when Information for Health was produced, it was a national strategy for local implementation. Three years into its implementation, we found that the service was saying to us, actually what we need is more central control of the money and more central direction. And that, of course, is going uh, in a counter direction to uh, the way in which the, the NHS as a whole is going as it shifts the balance of power. Um, one of the other important uh, milestones along the way, I think, that we've passed was in December of uh, 2001 when we had a conference that Secretary of State and Bill Gates were both at. Uh, and in that conference, it was quite clear that Secretary of State was keen to make sure that information was now seen as, as mainstream, that it, that it left what was perceived to be a bit of a silo, that it became understood as being one of the key underpinning uh, platforms on which a modern NHS had to be built. And that was followed by a seminar at uh, number 10 Downing Street in February of last year. And at that seminar, uh, the changes were um, discussed that, that uh, were then uh, announced in June by Lord Hunt around delivering 21st century IT. And what I'd like to do now is just to talk through uh, very briefly the sorts of changes that uh, were, were announced then. The, the changes have to sit on, on top of a decent infrastructure. So accelerating uh, connectivity uh, and connecting the NHS with a secure broadband. And on top of that infrastructure, we need to be able to provide uh, better prescription services, booking services, and building lifelong health records. As we do that, uh, we need to uh, make sure that we are partnering with uh, the government and industry, that there's some national direction and performance management and at the top that we have increased the uh, funding necessarily and found ways of, of pro properly and effectively ring fencing it. So for the patient then, delivering 21st century uh, IT uh, reiterates the points that, that we have been making for some time that its services designed around each patient, each patient's choice and that they need to be done quickly, conveniently and seamlessly. Uh, for staff, delivering 21st century IT has to be about providing uh, better electronic communications, knowledge management uh, and support, uh, and faster access to essential uh, information and other access to specialist and specialised expertise. And for managers, there's certainly good quality data to support national service frameworks, clinical audit governance. and lastly but not least and, and importantly still the management information agenda. So those are the objectives that we've set ourselves in delivering 21st century IT and let me just very swiftly outline the main planks of it. There's a national infrastructure, uh, the NHS net which we currently have and will be being re-procured so that it is a secure broadband environment. Uh, the uh, email and directory services we've now got being uh, developed as, as a national service. Uh, we have information services, the NHS.UK environment is the one where uh, one can see what services are available where so that patient's choice can be exercised. The National Electronic Library of Health is the environment where it's possible to get ready access to good quality and contemporary knowledge, clinical evidence, etc. And we have a range of application services, uh, e-learning, which we will see uh, being a very important part of the uh, NHS U when that uh, becomes operational. NHS Direct will be well known to you all, I'm sure. So those are just some illustrations, really, of the different aspects of the basic national information infrastructure services that need to be provided. 
Now, let me turn to the uh, major pillar of, of importance, the integrated care record services. And that cartoon that uh, is used there uh, has been taken from uh, an edition of The Economist, and it was used uh, to introduce a piece uh, which introduced uh, Richard Granger, the new Director General. But it summarised, I think, for them, and, and I guess for their readership, the general state of, of, of uh, the art of the management of records in the NHS at the moment. A pretty appalling and shambolic uh, state for us to be in. It's not, of course, like that, or at least not like that everywhere. Um, but it's important, I think, to understand that we're now talking about integrated care record services and move on in the thinking from the electronic patient records and electronic health records that were talked about in uh, information for health. And it's integrated for the reasons that I've, I've been talking about already, really, that we need to find ways of, of integrating information within and between uh, NHS and other organisations. It's about care. It's not just about medical services. It's in going to be increasingly about health and social care. Uh, it's about records, certainly, what has happened. Um, and it's about services rather than systems. In other words, it's freeing up the mindset about how the relevant information for clinicians is brought to the point of delivery of care, the core uh, requirement really from information for health, and saying, well, actually, what are the services that need to be provided to enable integrated care records to be assembled and presented to the uh, clinician and indeed the patient so that they can take well-informed decisions at the point of care? The core components of it really are that we focus on getting uh, the generic requirements for administration, ordering, reporting and booking teased out and that we maximise the uh, capacity that the NHS has as a major uh, organisation uh, to uh, get those um, generic requirements being provided as cost effectively as possible that we pay attention to the user environment and make sure that the, uh, the tools that are available and, and the management arrangements, the information governance arrangements are properly there to enable uh, integrated care to be provided uh, and that we deal with certain sector specific functions because although there are a lot of generic issues, of course there will still be some particular issues in mental health for example, or maternity services. Uh, that we deal effectively with national service frameworks and that we're able to work across communities. And really just to uh, re-emphasise the importance of keeping hold of the strategic uh, direction of travel, of having person-based, integrated person-based systems, which by implication means that they have to be capable of working both within and across communities. Again, there's another tragic case study really. Uh, Ainley Walker. And in the uh, report on uh, the death of two-year-old Ainley Walker, it was stated that it is particularly remarkable that for almost a year, health agencies, the police and housing all had serious concerns, but none of this information passed to social services, recommended that each agency reassess the process of record-keeping and tracking information uh, relevant to the protection and welfare of children. So we have to find ways of enabling the integration of information within and across uh, those organisations that are caring for individuals. To do that, uh, the procurement uh, of, of uh, information and IT services for the NHS has been a major challenge and one which, again, many in the NHS locally have been finding very exacting um, and we uh, understand would uh, find it helpful if there was more being undertaken centrally. Now the way in which that is done needs to be reflected in local delivery plans which are being worked on at the moment. The national programme is talking about having prime service providers or prime contractors being the agency by which the IT community is assembled to provide the relevant services to a strategic health authority. And it's very important that the agenda for delivering IT is now aligned across the 28 strategic health authorities. 
and that to do that there needs to be engagement with NHS trusts and primary care organisations. And I think this last point is going to become an increasing challenge to us over the next few months as the uh, prime contractors be begin to be assembled and the strategic health authorities and their chief information officers are working away as they are now, actually getting engagement with NHS trusts and primary care organisations is going to be critical. And as we do that, we need to be avoiding planning blight because although this uh, change in uh, tack rather than a change of direction, I think, uh, is uh, important to get right. Nevertheless, we want to avoid any unnecessary planning blight locally. So, that's what we're doing on the procurement side. On the uh, people's front, that there are two, two uh, points I want to make here, really. Firstly, that we need to be thinking about ways of getting health informatics skills made available for all staff. So. The, the uh, European Computer Driving Licence, ECDL, is an example of one of the basic sets of skills that we wish through the uh, uh, aegis of the NHSU and others to be made available to all uh, NHS staff to get the basic skills that are going to be needed to manage information. And on this slide, there's just an illustration, really, of the range of skills that we uh, need to be uh, making available to health informatics specialists. There's a big agenda for us to make sure that we're able to retain and develop within the NHS the uh, skilled specialists that are definitely going to be needed to take forward this, this agenda. So, having said that, let me just make a few observations about some of the challenges in delivering 21st century IT. Well, we've got some very important uh, milestones taken. We've got high level political support. I've mentioned the seminar at number 10, for example. Um, there's a ministerial task force that Lord Hunt is chairing. It's met twice now and is, I think, going to be a very effective vehicle, actually, for making sure that we continue to have high level and informed ownership of this agenda. Part of the task force's uh, remit has clearly been uh, already to, to, to get the engagement of the senior uh, people within the, the clinical community and that's been a very encouraging step forward. I think the task for the next few months and, and, and indeed years is to make sure that not only do we have the informed engagement of the very senior clinical professions but actually through uh, the work that the uh, strategic health authorities, trusts and PCOs do that we get the informed engagement of local clinicians because at the end of the day, if we're talking about information systems that are there to support the core business processes, then we have to have the informed support of the clinical community. Uh, the management support uh, that we've had has been uh, very impressive, and I am certainly hopeful that the uh, Strategic Health Authority chief execs and their colleagues working in the other parts of the NHS are able increasingly, I think, to understand that information and IT actually really is moving into the mainstream and that they can't do their delivery plans without it playing an important part uh, uh, and that perf good performance in delivering on information and IT is something that is in their uh, personal interests as well. Uh, there is significant funding becoming available and it will be being handled in a way that gives us greater central control certainly over the new monies that are going to be made available to the service. We've got Richard Granger in post as the Director General and Richard is making a tremendous difference already in the way in which we shape up the national program and really begin to get to grips with the supplier community and the new ways of delivering information and IT. And in, the, in, in this process, the role of the strategic health authorities will be uh, uh, very important. Um, and the position of chief information officers within them, I think, has been an earnest of our intent that, at that level, they do take a uh, comprehensive view of the information requirements within the uh, constituent PCTs uh, and, and trusts. So, some challenges that, that lie ahead. Um, 
The procurement strategy and the way in which that plays through is going to be of, um, is indeed a world-class challenge. I mean, there aren't many, in fact, I, I can't think of any uh, uh, procurements that are going on that are uh, bigger and, and, and more complex than the ones that we're in the process of getting into now in the NHS. I've mentioned the importance of the engagement of, of stakeholders and I think that remains uh, an important challenge. What I'm alluding to when, in flagging up the business process and, and, and cultural change challenge is certainly uh, there is a view that says focus on getting the technology in and that will generate the change, the business process change and, and the attitudinal change. There's another view that says actually what you need to do first is to focus on the business processes and the cultural change and then you can introduce IT that people want to know how to use. And I think the way in which we resolve those tensions, and I suspect it's not a, an either or but a both, both and uh, approach that will be needed, is, is going to be a challenge to us. And lastly, the informed patient and citizen. If we're talking about having person-based systems and empowering individuals and giving them choice, then I believe that over the next few years we're going to find that the expectation of patients and the public in general uh, are going to be an increasingly important factor in the way in which the uh, uh, expectations of this agenda are, uh, are set and the way in which we can manage expectations of patients and the public uh, and indeed of chief execs and clinicians and uh, uh, the uh, ministerial colleagues and, and policy colleagues represent some of the many plates that we continue to be spinning. So I hope that's given you a uh, quick uh, trip through my world uh, and I hope I've done so in a way in which you will find able to uh, engage with it and, and uh, I'd be very happy to uh, take part in, in discussion that uh, I hope will uh, have been stimulated by this uh, presentation. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much Peter, it was a very interesting discussion. Um, now of course is your chance at home to, uh, home, <laughs> bloody hell, uh, uh, in, in your various centres of course, I hope none of you are at home, uh, to phone in or email us with your, with your comments. Um, Telephone number to phone in on is 01752-233-646 or you can email on tvstudio at plymouth.ac.uk. So do please uh, contact the studio now with your, with your comments and questions. But in the meantime, we'll start off with um, Daniel. Do you want to kick off the discussion? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, excellent presentation. Very informative. Um, but I, I took the liberty of, uh, of asking some of my questions colleagues and contacts, uh, you know, what questions they'd like to ask mm -hmm. via me. And uh, Peter Malewish and, uh, has, has replied, and Peter is a senior lecturer in health informatics at the University of the West of England. Um, and his question, uh, very, very, with great foresight, touched on some of the challenges you mentioned, specifically the procurement strategy. Uh, and Peter asks, uh, a big concern of his is the mechanics of re-exerting central control for ICT in areas of procurement especially EPR, and he goes on, will we be seeing a short list of compatible mandated systems for acute trusts, mental health and PCT stroke community use? Uh, and if not, why not? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, the approach that we're, that we're taking um, is to uh, get the prime contractors uh, sorted out during the next few months and whilst we're doing that there's also a design authority being established uh, under the aegis of, of the national program and the relationship between the design authority uh, and the uh, supplier community through the selection of, of the prime contracts and prime service providers is going to result in there being the solutions that we, we will then be um, needing to get the strategic health authorities to work with and to develop um, as we get to the back end of, of this year. Now, I can't say to you that there will be a specific uh, number or range of uh, services that will be available, but quite clearly the intent is 
to uh, manage the existing range of choice down mm -hmm. so that what's available is quite uh, clearly being provided cost effectively and that it can be tested for its interoperability in ways which I think we, we, we haven't been doing effectively uh, to date. So uh, we're in the, uh, to, to, to give a, a steer on the direction of travel, it's reducing the amount of choice mm -hmm. but uh, what we have to do as I was alluding to in my uh, presentation is in the process of, of making that reduction in choice at the same time be finding ways to play into that process the strategic health authorities and their informed engagement with their constituent trusts and, and, and uh, primary care organisations and it's, it's therefore very important that although the debate and discussion may be being perceived as going on at a national level at this stage actually I think it is hugely important for uh, those working in the NHS to be getting very clear about what their existing range of electronic record services actually are and being clear about what they think their requirements are going to be because they will then need to be able to articulate those very clearly to their strategic health authorities and then with them making the appropriate selection and then development of the integrated care record service solutions that the primary contractors will be uh, offering. And would that also plug into something, another point you made in your presentation, which was uh, local IT me uh, sorry local IT monies being used on other priorities, uh, and perhaps that being an area where you would see more central control. So perhaps yeah. central control also specifying what monies perhaps need to be made or left to, to be available for things like procurement of EPR. Yeah, the the, the uh, approach that we are working towards. Um, and forgive me if I'm slightly hesitant here because I've been, I've been out of the country the last week or so and I, I don't know whether announcements on this particular point have actually been crystallised yet but the general, the general approach is that we are looking to have the new monies that become available as a result of the uh, last spending round being controlled by the centre all right? and they will be released uh, to strategic health authorities on the basis of agreed uh, local delivery plans or the, uh, the information component of, 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 of the local delivery plans and that means that in contrast to the way in which money is being handled for virtually all of the rest of, of the uh, NHS that which is to do with the new spend on information IT will be under the control of the uh, processes that will involve the, the centre. Um, now, what at the same time we don't want to happen though is for any new money to be used to kind of backfill previous spend. So part of, part of what we will be looking for is evidence that the existing money that has been in previous years new money, uh, which is now in baseline, isn't actually being sucked off to be used for other priorities. So uh, another reason really for the NHS being quite clear about what its existing services, what its existing spend are, what it proposes it will do prospectively with new monies that, that become available. The difference now is that those new monies won't be going straight out into the, the baseline spend. So we hope that we have now got over the deficiencies that hypothecation and then ring fencing actually uh, had in, in practice. Mm. Okay. Pass on to Jason, do you want to come in with any? Yeah, I think uh, today's focus, um, or our opening title was on information strategies and uh, you outlined some of the history of better information and information for health. Um, my question focuses around uh, something I think you hinted at in terms of chicken and egg mm -hmm. around do we go for systems, do we go for processes. And I wonder about do we go for IT or do we go for information. The first two <laughs> strategies have the word information in them. The delivery strategy focuses on 21st century IT. IT. Yes. And do you feel within the strategy development that we've actually identified what the information needs are for the health services rather than running ahead and procuring IT systems that may or may not deliver those information requirements. Okay. 
Thank you for that uh, question. There, there's been um, a lot of uh, time spent debating whether we should be talking about IT or information or ICT. Personally, I've always felt pretty comfortable with the with the uh, words that we'd used since '92: uh, information management and technology. And in my mind, I'm still in that mindset because it, it, it's a mindset that enables me to feel quite comfortable with a program that is talking about delivering 21st century IT, which is what Richard Granger is, is the Director General of. And that program has to succeed. We have to have a radical change in change of pace and direction as I've, uh, I've been indicating to, to get the basic technology in place. No doubt about that, and we have to make sure that the resources, people, money, etc., are lined up to enable that to happen. But that, in itself, whilst a necessary, isn't a sufficient condition. And the other part of, of um, my role is is to be thinking about the policies around information management, and that was why, for example, I was quite careful to include in the presentation a couple of slides at the end that, that was talking about the, the informatics skills that we need to have for everybody as well as for specialist informatics staff because unless we are also uh, clear in our thinking about how we can help people in the NHS and indeed people within the Department of Health be clearer about what information it is they need to manage whatever aspect of the business it's in, whichever plates they happen to be spinning, then I think we, we don't stand any real chance of getting sensible IT solutions in place and being used. So I guess the answer to your question is, yes, I think we do need to have a, a very clear view about what we're going to do with information management issues as well as the IT. That is quite properly in focus, but actually there will continue to be a requirement for us to engage with the service and indeed with colleagues in the Department of, of Health to make sure that the information management agenda is being properly addressed. We'll come to you, Nick, in a minute. Can I pick up? A, I had an email from uh, Annie Jenkin, uh, who's a senior lecturer at uh, in Plymouth University. As a user of IT for patient-centred care, it required considerable training and development for all staff to use the facilities. How do you envisage supporting the various healthcare establishments. I guess it's something that Daniel might come back onto as well at the end of this, but the training issue. The healthcare establishments, yes. Well, there are all sorts of healthcare establishments on there. Um, and I mean, I say that lightly, but actually what, what uh, I mean, I, I say it lightly in a sense because um, we are looking as we re-procure the NHS networking services, the sort of the N3 programme as, as it's been called, to have a much more open uh, approach to the way in which we develop network-based services in, in the NHS. So in our thinking, as we uh, refine the requirements and, and get the process underway, is not just what clinicians within the NHS need, but actually what the requirements of NHS staff are going to be wherever they happen to be, and also what at home and, and, and in the NHS and what, what are going to be the requirements of the academic community. I've mentioned the NHSU several times, and one of the reasons for doing that, I think, is, is because the, the way in which the NHSU is looking to operate is, I mean, in a sense, our information strategy has patients or citizens at the centre of it. The NHSU actually has the people that are engaged in the delivery of services within health and, and social care at the centre of it. And, and so from their perspective, it's very important that we have the uh, skills and the knowledge and the information that people need to do, to do whatever it is they need to be trained to do available whenever that's uh, required. So uh, we are in the process of trying to put in place a comprehensive and a flexible and an open yet secure, and that's an interesting tension, a uh, set of networking services that will enable all staff that are engaged within and for the NHS to get the data, the information, the knowledge that they need. So our, our, our direction of travel, I think, is going to be addressing and picking up the, the issues that were being raised in, in that email. Okay, can, do you mind if I come in? Because the NHSU is something that interests me. Um, what do you see as the role between the NHSU and these other things that exist, the existing universities? 
I mean, these other things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what you know? How how does the NHSU fit with this? I mean, are, is the NHSU going to be doing continuing professional development? We, we've got Diamond and from NHSU coming in, in March to explain it in more detail. Well, what's your yeah. what's your okay, understanding, well, well, particularly in relation to health informatics well, and in relation to sort of thing that you know that, that Daniel's doing it yeah. in these learning networks? Okay, ha ha happy to say a few words about that, and I'm delighted Di Millen's coming, partly because Di in working for the NHS Information Authority half time, spends the other half of her time working with the NHSU and we've been keen to have the health informatics agenda being one of the parts of the NHSU environment that is sort of up and running pretty soon after the NHSU comes on stream. Partly because for the NHSU concept to work there needs to be the basic infrastructure in place, not just the technical infrastructure, but people with the basic skills to be able to log on, which is why I was make, mentioning the ECDL uh, environment. So I think it's in everybody's interest, and the NHSU certainly understand this, that we, that we get that the, the basic informatics environment in place early on. But I also think it's important for us to get the information environment played in early in the NHSU, because actually, We've got a very good story to tell. There's been a huge amount of work been going on that the NHS Information Authority has, has had underway in various guises over the last few years. And a very important part of that work has been to engage with the different educational establishments. And the process that people like Di Millen have been going through of developing the links with the courses that are run in these different uh, establishments to get the proper sort of accreditation processes in place, I think are going to prove to be, I hope, very good exemplars of the way in which the NHSU will work collaboratively with the different educational establishments so that we can be clear what the skills are that people require, what Need, what needs then to be done to enable people to gain those skills, where those skills can be provided from, and that the ways in which the existing educational establishments can have what they can offer marshal together within a coherent framework that the NHSU can provide from the end user's point of view, I, I think offers tremendous win-win possibilities actually. But it, it, it's important that we get the uh, uh, the academic organisations working in a constructive frame of mind, I think, with the NHSU and, and vice versa. It, it, collaboration is the name of this game, and jointly badged uh, products, I think, will be to everybody's advantage. So, mm -hmm. yep, that's my take. Nick, you're on time. Yes, thank you, Peter. I, I enjoyed your presentation. It raises more questions, uh, of course, than it answers. <laughs> um, particularly enjoyed the list of challenges, which I'm sure have a, a a lot of resonance amongst the local IT fraternity mm. here. Um, I'd like to pick up, make one, make one observation, which is uh, you, you did allude to the attention of security and, and uh, access. Um, I would have seen that as a major challenge uh, to the, the, the uh, new approaches. And the question uh, I'd like to focus on relates to stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. um, there is a tension there between the increasing amount of data that is being expected of clinicians and clinicians often see that as being to feed the managerial beast rather than for the benefit of healthcare. And I wondered how you saw us being able to engage clinicians in using that information which is vital for all the information um, uh, delivery that we're talking about. Uh, and see it as being part of their own working existence. Yeah, absolutely. If you remember, one, one of the uh, slides that I used had the uh, benefits for management of, of delivering 21st century IT. And I, I put in there, actually, the clinical governance uh, and management information at the end, because that is how I see it. In other words, the priority is to get the, the direct support being given properly informed to, to the patient and then on the back of that to get the healthcare professionals assessing how they are delivering and how they can improve the delivery of the quality of, of, of services and that raises all sorts of issues about um, how the data and the, the degree of granularity of the data that's available that's necessary to make those, those sorts of, of, of judgments and really it continues to need to be the case as actually it always has been, 
that it's on the back of that. I mean, going back to 19... Oh, so for long ago, I can't even remember, the early 1980s when Edith Kerner was talking about the principles of information management, that, that the management information comes as a byproduct of that, and that has to remain the case. So I think the, the, the key thing is to get the clinical community uh, and the research community involved in um, helping improve the processes of the delivery of care. And when I say that, I, I am also, in my mind, thinking about the delivery of, of public health services too. It isn't just about the one-to-one -one delivery of care, but finding the ways in which we can get the information that helps improve the delivery of health care to a population. And as we do that, I think as a byproduct of that, we will find that we get the management information we need. And I think just on an interesting note about one of the, from our point of view, I think very beneficial side effects of, of shifting the balance of power. What the department has been increasingly recognising is that it's been asking too much of the service. And there's now a gateway process in place that is there to, to reduce the load. And what we will be seeing played out over the next few months and years, I think, is a review of the information that is actually needed by the centre. And I think the direction of travel is to reduce that rather than increase it. At least that, that is the theory that is being espoused and, and the various um, arrangements being put in place to achieve that. Um, of course, it is always going to be very difficult when there is a high-profile case around a particular individual or set of circumstances for there not then to be arrangements in place for all the contextual information that ex go to explain that particular circumstance to be instantly available and for those arrangements to be in place there's always the temptation to have you know that information being collected as a matter of routine because it might be needed so there are those tensions to be uh, continue to be resolved but uh, uh, the direction of travel I think is is right May I just comment? Mm. It's, it's welcome news to hear that because one of the tensions I'm sure you're aware of locally is the, the need for um, well, targets being set around information for things like NSFs, mm -hmm. uh, waiting list information mm -hmm. for cancer and the mm -hmm. like, and the inability of the clinicians to collect the data. Yeah. And it's Im imposing huge burdens on yeah. all clinical and informatics yeah. staff trying to find that information. Uh, uh, absolutely, and I think that... Um, Part of the problem is that the clinicians don't have the sort of functionality in their integrated care record services coupled with booking systems, for example, that they need mm -hmm. as a matter of day-to-day -day routine to then generate the information that's actually being asked for urgently as a byproduct. And it's very tempting, and we've succumbed to the temptation, I regret to say, in certain areas to have ad hoc or kind of short-term data collections put in place to meet a... Whereas actually we, sh we, we should be increasingly trying to hold the position that as we get properly specified and functional ICRS systems in place, we will then actually have the capacity to deal with the rest of, of the requirements. But it is a very, very tricky thing to do. I mean, the, the, the way in which we get the granularity of the information embedded in the information systems and the governance arrangements for that are very difficult to get right, and, and not just NHS, but internationally too. I mean, this is, this is a central problem and why it's important that we get the relationships right between the high-level issues that may need to concern people when information needs to be exchanged between one healthcare professional and another, and the data sets that may be needed, uh, and the clinical terms that underpin all of this. And it's a very rich mix of, 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 of data and information requirements that we have to uh, find ways of getting properly managed. I've got a, um, an email from uh, Marcelo Lopez, who's a, uh, a GP in Bodmin, uh, asking about what's the uh, strategy for collaborating with, with Europe and what happens with patients who um, go from, from this country to, to Spain uh, and, and back again. We seem to be collaborating on SNOMED with, with America, but what, what, what's happening with Europe? Very good question. Um, I think it's fair to say that we have not, to date, been thinking as openly and as constructively as we need to be about 
the ways in which we collaborate with Europe. However, having said that, I think it's fair to say from the experience that I have of, of um, visits to Europe on a few occasions just to talk about what we're doing in the UK, that actually m most of Europe look to the UK to get a feel for what the state of the art is actually in terms of, of handling health information. Um, so I don't kind of feel too b bad about it but on the other hand what I do believe is that as we move into an environment where it's the choice environment really where it's legitimate for people to choose where they receive their health care whether that's in the NHS whether it's in the private sector in this country, a diagnostic and treatment centre, or whether indeed they go over the channel to Europe. So it becomes increasingly important if we are to continue, as we need to continue, to have person-based systems, that we do find ways in which we can be quite clear about what the basic information requirements are that need to be given to that patient, whether they're seeking care in Europe or, or outside the NHS, uh, in such a way that we are able to provide citizens of this country with integrated information about their, their health care. So, yes, we need to do more with Europe, but actually that's only part of the picture. And indeed, not just Europe, but, but the states and Canada I mean, globally, there needs to be a shift towards having agreement about information standards. And interestingly, I think uh, over the next few years, just picking up on my, on my penultimate bullet point about uh, the informed citizen, although I might have given the impression that that's obviously just the citizen in this country, of course, with the internet and the capability to, to uh, access and log on wherever you happen to be globally now, I mean, increasingly we ought to be thinking about the way in which we develop information standards for global use. And that, I think, raises a whole set of very interesting strategic and operational challenges. Gentlemen, you got any other points for Peter? I think I've got a very easy question, having okay. fielded all the, all the tough ones. And this, this actually is one from a, a consultant in Taunton called uh, Steve Jones, uh, who's, I think, a Caldecott Guardian, um, and he's accessed the IPU website, because um, there's a Caldecott Guardian page there. But he's asking, um, does the IPU have a role in ensuring that Caldecott Guardians have up-to-date guidance on the views of other bodies, and he quotes such as the GMC. Uh, yes, I think we do, and uh, the work that's gone on from within, being led by um, Phil Walker and colleagues within the Information Policy Unit is, is reflected on that website. Uh, there is a very important part of the delivering 21st century IT program that will be concerned with confidentiality issues and Phil is also working closely with colleagues in the NHS Information Authority to take those those uh, issues forward. Um, the way in which Caldecott Guardians can be made aware of current issues I think uh, is a nice uh, illustration actually of one of the generic problems that we've got, one of the generic weaknesses actually that we have, which is that the way in which information about what's going on seems to flow uh, tends to be within a local community and upwards, mm -hmm. upwards to the centre. And we, as an NHS I think, have been rather poor at finding ways in which we can support people who want to find out laterally in a sense what's going on elsewhere. And I hope that one of the benefits that having a rich and, and, and functional NHS infrastructure is actually going to be to enable a Caldecott guardian in one environment to be in active communication with their colleagues right across the NHS. If the IPU can sort of help facilitate those sorts of arrangements then, then we will try and do so. We've certainly been trying to adapt or adopt this approach with um, the development of, of learning networks that, that the uh, Information Authority have been promoting. Uh, and and I, I'm sure that, that the NHSU, for example, will kind of provide another environment in which it becomes uh, relatively easy and, and, and accepted to, to, to trawl around for your current views about what's happening elsewhere. But I have to say that from my point of view, 
one of the things that I know is the case that, is that although uh, within the NHS there will be people who have got problems, <laughs> equally there are people who have got solutions and who are doing very good things. And again, it's very difficult as we are currently able to work, to, to, to get ready knowledge of those good things being shared widely. And I, again, I think that is something on my agenda, certainly, to try and see what we can do as we, as we shift the balance of power and we deliver 21st century IT, to find ways of encouraging these lateral communications of, of problems and also of, of good practice too. I'm afraid that we're going to have to sort of draw that to a close because we're coming up to uh, to time out and I've got a few uh, sort of things to tell people about the future. Okay. First of all, I thank very much Peter Drury for a wonderful presentation, Daniel McCarthy, Jason Bradley, Nick Gaunt. Thank you all for your participation and thank you for the uh, people who emailed in the questions. In February, there are three events that I want to tell you about. On Thursday, February the 13th, we have another two seminars. The first one at 12 p.m. on the 13th, we have Martin Warren and Matt Lobley uh, giving a dual presentation to discuss the health of rural communities. I think that many of you watching this seminar today will be interested in that, particularly in the work of Martin Warren, who will describe his work in virtual villages and how the internet can help give support to people in rural settings. We'll be discussing the role of social support in health. Matt Lobley will be describing how events in recent years, such as the foot and mouth epidemic, have had an impact on families in rural areas. In the second seminar that day at 2 p.m., uh, we have Professor Barbara Katz Rothman, who's a visiting professor from New York. Um, many of you will know her. She's a very famous uh, book she's written called The Tentative Pregnancy, and she'll be discussing that book. And lastly, I'd like to mention another event, two days after that, on February the 15th in London. All of us working in health will recognise that the greatest cause of premature mortality in children is war. Tony Blair thinks that by bombing and murdering women and children in Iraq, it will somehow lead to a safer world. People who disagree with him will be demonstrating in London on Saturday, February the 15th, so you may wish to put that date in your diary too. Once again, thanks very much to Peter Drury and all, to all of you. Goodbye. Good afternoon and welcome to another Institute of Health Studies Satellite Seminar. We're broadcasting from the University of Plymouth and in the studio today we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Peter Drury. Peter will be a very well-known figure to many of you and he was influential in the development of the Information Strategy for the Department of Health. He's worked with Frank Burns to produce Information for Health and since 1999 he's been the Head of Information Policy Unit for the Department of Health. This unit gives guidance to the NHS on IMT policy and implementation. Peter was responsible for updating the policy document, implementing the NHS plan, building the information core, and he's also helped guide the development of delivering 21st century IT program in 2002. In the studio to discuss Peter's presentation, we have three of the key people involved in health informatics in the Southwest. Daniel McCarthy is manager of the Southwest Health Informatics Learning Network. Jason Bradley works for the NHS Information Authority, and Dr. Nick Gaunt is Project Director for the South and West Devon Electronic Health Records Project, Lead for Health Informatics, and in his spare time he's a consultant microbiologist. As well as being key figures in their day jobs in health informatics, all three are coming together to form a British Computer Society Southwest Health Informatics Group with Daniel as a chair. Lastly, you've got me, I'm Ray Jones, and I'm Professor of Health Informatics and Director of Research at the Institute of Health Studies about services designed around the patient. So although in 92 we talked about person-based systems, actually it wasn't really until the whole uh, NHS plan began to talk about shifting the thinking so that the patient is in focus rather than the profession or the organisation that we really uh, had much of a chance, I think, of, of beginning to implement the strategy effectively. 
another very important uh, part of, of the context has been the development of the e-government strategy, which is trying to ensure that across government, the citizen in that context is at the focus of uh, the development of, 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 of information and management policy. How is it that citizens can easily get access to the information they need? And in the NHS context, that is increasingly being translated into the choice agenda so that, for example, we can now have uh, patients able to choose not only when but where they can have their uh, care being delivered. And these changes have only just begun really to be articulated uh, in the last two years or so. Uh, since 98, we've had much greater attention being paid to the development of clinical standards, of clinical governance, and the development of care pathways, all things that are very necessary uh, to have uh, person-based uh, care and have important corollaries for the information services that are needed to underpin them. Organisationally, of course, we've had the shifting the balance of power, uh, strategy which we are of course in, in the process of, of, of working through at the moment and that is pr that there are perhaps sort of particular places where the plate juggler needs to give the uh, give the plate and, and the pole a, a particular push and I think there's also the implication that actually it isn't just that particular plate juggler this is a landscape full of plates on poles and if we think actually about what the plates might be and think that actually in the context of the NHS the plates are patients then actually we are all juggling a lot of plates it's certainly not just me and the information policy in it and part of the importance I think of understanding where information fits in is the realization that actually the management of information requires a lot of different people to be involved each of them to playing their part in spinning the pole so that the plate or the, or the patient is properly looked after. And when that goes well, then that's wonderful. But when it doesn't go well, then we can have the tragedies such as, as the fate of Victoria Climbier. Um, and there'll be a report, the formal report, on her tragic uh, death uh, being published very shortly. But in essence, uh, it was quite clear that in deciding who was to blame for her death, social workers, police, doctors, all named and shamed. So the basic point is that healthcare is something where information needs to be exchanged, not just within the NHS, but if we're taking a, an approach where the plate or the patient is the centre of our attention, then there are a lot of people that all have to play their part in keeping uh, the show on the road. So with that sort of just general introduction, let me press on by taking as my starting point getting better with information which as a strategy we published in 1992 and I don't make apologies for going back to 1992 to start this presentation because I think when we published that strategy we made the uh, basic uh, strategic uh, direction in terms of having person-based systems resting on top of a national infrastructure and frankly that has remained our strategic direction of travel ever since. Now, the difficulties with information for health were that it came with no money, there was very little political support, uh, there was certainly not much informed clinical support, uh, and it was perceived during the course of the 1990s, the early 1990s to generate, as being very much concerned really with providing information for managers. And it was clear or became clear during the 1990s that when the time came to have a refresh of the strategy that that needed to be undertaken preferably by somebody who, who came from the service as Frank Burns did and Frank's uh, lead in developing the information for health strategy in 1998 had as its sort of defining criteria the desire to develop information that was really there to support the core business of the NHS, that's to say the delivery of care to patients. Um, and what I want to talk about really is what has happened since 1998 and the publication of, of Information for Health. And there have been a number of very important shifts in the balance of power since then, which 
we need to be aware of. For example, the NHS plan began to talk explicitly. What we will do in this next hour is first Peter will give a presentation for about 20 to 25 minutes. And at the end of his presentation, he will join us again here for discussion. That will be your chance to contact the studio with your comments and questions. There are two ways in which you can contact the studio, and details of these will appear on your screen in a minute. And I'll tell you again after Peter's presentation, but if you've got a pen and paper handy, you should note them now. You can phone in using your mobile or any other phone available on 01752 233 646. Or you can email tvstudio at plymouth.ac.uk. As well as viewers down here in the southwest of England, we hope to have viewers from around Britain. And it would be good for us to have some idea of how many centres and people are tuned in today. So maybe one person at your centre could contact the studio using one of these methods during Peter's presentation in the next half hour to say where you are and how many are viewing at your centre. So now we go over to Peter Drury. Good afternoon everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, be able to take part in this uh, seminar today. What I'd like to do is to talk through some of the background uh, to where we are in taking forward the existing information strategy. Um, I'm head of the information policy unit and as such I feel very often as though it's a case of, of juggling a lot of plates. But the reason that I, I rather like this slide is partly because it also shows the fact that the plate juggler has been travelling uh, and I think it also gives an indication that uh, he's on the move and on the move forward. But the other reason that I, I also like it is that it, in, in the poles that are on, the, uh, on, 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 on top of which the plates are, it's also clear 